Hi, I'm Bianca, and we're doing intercultural communication theories. So I'm going to start off by asking you, who are you without your culture? In the basic hierarchy of needs, the top tier is self-actualization, life fulfillment and value that people strive to achieve before they pass. It's what matters in your life to you. Now, this fulfillment is different for everyone. However, according to Haggerty, a big depictor of what it looks like depends on the culture around you. Culture shapes so much of life, and it is an essential part of individual identity. Therefore, it is important to understand and communicate interculturally. Now, most of us have not been exposed to many different cultures besides the ones that we were born and raised into. Those of you who have attained some exposure most likely understand the necessity of respecting other cultures, their views, and their beliefs. Luckily, by the end of the speech, we will have enhanced your understanding of intercultural communicative theories. Now, we have read and analyzed many different resources in order to become properly informed, and we've attained the ability to share this with you. In our speech, we will be educating you on the necessity of intercultural communication through the different theories that amplify its significance. Change slide. So first, Dawn is going to start us off by discussing symbolic interaction theory. Second, Ashley will go over social learning theory. Third, Justice will talk about cultural studies. Then Albany will analyze space negotiation theory. Following, Emily will interpret gender-like theory, and I will finish with proxemics theory. So now that I've introduced the presentation, Don will start us off. Hi, so basic definition of symbolic interaction. According to Axon, Kisak, Aiden, and Demir Bukin in their 2009 article, when talking about social studies, objects don't have a meaning on their own apart from social actors such as symbols. Symbolic interaction is a process of interpreting an action such as human behaviors, hand gestures, etc. An example of symbolic interaction would be using the word cat or like in the PowerPoint, um, a tree because it has no real definition and you just know it based on its characteristics. Um, in an article by Gerritsen in 1962, though it's outdated, it states a good description of symbolic interaction theory, stating it's focused upon the importance of language as an instrument of definition and communication. Then he states people are seen as responding not directly to a resistant outer reality, but to meanings of objects. Next slide. Importance of symbolic interaction in teamwork. In a journal article by Roark, Gillard, Wells, Evans, and Blauer in 2014, they discussed that an experiment had taken place where students got placed in groups where they would use symbolic interaction theory, or SIT, to build bonds between the kids. The purpose of the study was to examine the effects on the outcome of teamwork skills of three different SIT-based after-school program experiences that were independent of each other. In the end, it was found that the youth participants' teamwork skills increased with symbolic interaction theory, and the participants also had fun. Next slide. Symbolic interaction is thinking. In a book by the name of Handbook to Sociology Theory, Sheldon Stryker wrote chapter 11, where he discusses traditional and structural symbolic interaction theory and the framework for those that believe in this theory. He states, there is no symbolic interaction orthodoxy and that an adequate amount of social behavior must be incorporated into the perspectives of participants. By this, I believe he means that it's a way of communication more than a theory and social aspects affect it as well. From this, I have learned that symbolic interaction theory is studied a lot within sociology, but it always ties back to having the same meaning. It's a process that has enlivened the reciprocal meaning and values by aid of symbols in the mind. Next, Ashley will be discussing some social interaction theory. So according to Amy Yang, social learning theory is the learning process and social behavior which proposes that new behaviors can be acquired by observing and imitating others. This theory is taking place within an environment where observing how humans interact with each other, whether this is in person, online, 
or even through social media. As you're watching these individuals, you learn new habits that you may use in your lifetime. Some of these habits will create behaviors for each situation in a certain environment. There are four steps in this theory. Unfortunately, in my diagram on the screen, I do not have one of them. Um, the first one is observation, retention, reproduction, and motivation. You first observe the actions of others, and then you set this action in your head. Then you start to act out this action. And finally, motivation, you start to only use this action in certain situations that you think is the right placement for this action. The author by the name of Ridrow explains that you can manipulate your environment. This can either affect or not affect what behaviors that you will gain. This is also known as operant conditioning. Um, the authors of Smith and Burge believe that these interactions could show the observer an understanding of how each person's mind works. There was an experiment involving a bobo doll. A bobo doll is a doll that bounces back and forth, and however, if you do not move in time, you will get hit by this heavy doll. A few scientists placed a number of children who have not experienced this doll before to see how they would react toward it. After the research was done, they came to the conclusion that the children had the same behaviors that their parents expressed. As you can see that these actions are easily observed throughout families. Since most of our childhood, we spent observing our parents as role models. As children, we tend to mimic the way our parents um, do things. Um, an example of this in a situation is when our parents would argue in front of children. This triggers a sign that gives children an idea that this is normal. In later years, when they encounter the same situation, their first instinct is to result back to what they know. Of course, this does not happen in all situations. As I was saying before, that you can always learn new social traits that can influence your behaviors. And now Justice will discuss cultural studies. <clears throat> cultural studies. According to Bennett and a journal he wrote in 2005, he discusses combining the strengths of social sciences and the methods of humanities comes through theories of sociology, communications, and history. This study focuses on our changing world and adapting to new customs as cultures from societies change, from past, present, and prepares for the future. Cultural studies is an innovative field of research and teaching that investigates the ways in which culture creates and transforms individuals' experiences, everyday life, and social relations. Furthermore, exemplifies the relations between culture understood as human expressive and symbolic activities and cultures understood as distinctive ways of life and how humans differentiate. Culture is everything that makes you who you are, from physical features, race, religion, upbringing, and the people you talk to. All of these together create your personal culture and make you, you. Next slide, please. Being diverse and coming from different backgrounds creates a unique bond when all come together in one setting. From the first time we met, we all had common, common, common things that we, that we all loved, such as hiking, coffee, and food. Life has its up and ups and downs, and together, ups and downs, and finding people who can relate to or find sympathy for creates bonds and changes ways of thinking about life and the people surrounding it. Whether that stems from having opposing beliefs or simply different upbringings, people connect based on their equal relations to one another. People have the ability to change their ways of thinking, religious beliefs, and by way of friendships. Next slide, please. Our needs are fulfilled through social interactions that bind and, and with our biological associations. This developed as humans begin growing and maturing. Stewart, in a book he wrote in 1983, discussed, it is the arena of consent and resistance. We take in information from each other that we need to process and disregard the unimportant. Now that I have interpreted my knowledge of cultural studies, Albany will continue with face negotiation. According to Ting Tumi and Kurogi, 
face negotiation theory is a conflict theory used to better understand and provide explanations for how people from different cultures handle conflict. First theorized by Stella Ting Tooney in 1985, face negotiation theory examines the face or claimed self-image to understand certain conflict styles within different cultures. Change slide. According to Hugh, face is used as a metaphor for the self-image we hope to reject others. This face combines both the internal moral face and the external social face. The internal moral face involves identity qualities such as shame, integrity, and honor, where the external social face involves influential forces such as recognition, power, and authority. These two spectrums of face could be seen as the identity and ego. When confronted with conflict, one can experience face loss, the feeling of being threatened directly, one's face being threatened directly. According to Walsh, face work consists of all the strategies and communicative approaches one may use in order to maintain their chosen face or to challenge or uphold another's face. This includes verbal and nonverbal communication. However, this is not the same throughout cultures. According to Ting Tumi and Kurogi, face work and the perception of face in general differs among cultures. For example, there are higher self face concerns in individualist cultures and higher other face or mutual face concerns in collectivist cultures. According to Walsh, safe self face is a concern for one's own image. Others' face is a concern for another person's image, and mutual face is a concern for both people's image. <laughs> According to Ting Tumi and Kurogi, there are five distinct conflict styles, consisting of dominating, integrating, compromising, and obliging. The dominating conflict style emphasizes the defense of one's face by use of strategies to threaten another's face. Avoiding style emphasizes saving the face of another person in order to embarrass another's face. Integrating style emphasizes a mutual concern for both self-face and other face by keeping their conflict private. Compromise, compromising style emphasizes an agreement made which accommodates both the self-face and other face. And lastly, obliging style emphasizes self-face being left behind at the expense of another. So overall, face work is extremely insightful and influential in communication and culture. Ultimately, it attempts to provide a framework for understanding and possibly even predicting conflict styles and outcomes throughout culture. Now that I have explained face negotiation theory, Emily will explain gender luck theory. What is the gender luck theory? According to gender communication, Gender like theory is the theory that men and women have different languages based on their gender. This theory supports the concept that there are different expectations placed on both male and female. This is what causes there to be different interpretations of conversations between the two genders. Women like to communicate from an emotional and relationship point of view, while men prefer sticking to facts. Women tend to have report cooperative style talking, meaning women focus on feelings and building relationships, while men tend to have report competitive style talking, meaning they focus on power and status. What is an example of this? An example of this is that a social situation, women like seeking attention. This means they will likely put in more effort in the way they look. Men, on the other hand, are seeking status, meaning they focus on things like competitive accomplishments and they like to be the best. Next slide. Why is the gender like theory important? According to Cro origin state cultural gender communication, a gender like theory is important because one of the major problems that society faces today is the ability to communicate effectively. Both men and women today do not realize that while speaking to the opposite gender, there's a cross-culture happening. Deborah Tanner believes that if you 
learn how to understand the other gender, that there will not be as many miscommunications. Understanding that there is a cross-culture happening plays a major role in the development of successful communication. Next slide. Who created the gender like theory? According to Changing Minds, Deborah Tannen was born in 1945, and she's the one that created the term gender like theory in 1990 in her book, You Just Don't Understand Women and Men in the Conversation. Tannen's idea for writing this book is because she already wrote a book on the conversational styles in this book. She had one chapter on gender differences. After her audience reacted with a positive response, she decided to do another book and further research on the topic according to Georgetown. Now that I have explained what the gender-like theory is, Bianca will go over what proximeric theory is. So according to Nasiri, proxemics is the study of personal space and boundaries, specifically through observations and interactions. Simply through the way that people use the space and distance around themselves, they can convey many different conversational factors. For example, threat, intimidation, anxiety, comfort or discomfort, flirtation, or attraction. Now, it is important to understand that proxemics is not body language, but like body language, it is a subcategory of nonverbal communication. Body language covers body movement, posture, face expressions, while proxemics is about body proximity as well as spatial awareness, and it is strongly influenced by culture. Next slide. Gaining knowledge about proxemics can enhance one's ability to communicate effectively. According to Preston, proxemics can even be applied to persuasive communications in order to strengthen the message conveyed. Now, the use of spatial elements in order to persuade can give a slight edge, especially because it is often, often overlooked and used unconsciously by the speaker. Different cultures require a different norm of proxemics. People change the way they use their space depending on the situation they're in. For example, the air bubble expands or contracts depending on where you're at, the personal space air bubble. Also, in some cultures, being extremely close is threatening, while in others, it's a normal interaction. Now, because individual understanding of proxemics is influenced by culture, it's important to understand that these norms change depending on your cultural exposure. Now, according to Avison and Banks, it's something we take for granted because it's invisible to us. We automatically assume everything outside our cultural perspective is wrong. Because of this, it's important to remember that everyone has a different framework for what they consider correct, and this includes proxemics. So now that I've discussed proxemics, I will conclude our examination of intercultural theories. So in this speech, we've analyzed different theories underneath the intercultural branch of communication, and in doing so, we've proved the necessity and importance of intercultural communication. As you can see, first Don discussed symbolic interaction, then Ashley went over social learning, justice, cultural studies, Albany, face negotiation, Emily, gender elect, and then me, proxemics. Now, all these theories are different and important on their own, giving their own additions to the ways we understand each other. However, when they're all combined, it leads to an impactful form of communication, powerful enough to unite cultures.